Well, um, yeah, I just, you know, I need a, a break for me to take. The, no, you, I would totally hang out with you on Sunday, but uh, I need to take a break from like being on a shooting range all the time. I'm going to take like three days away from a shooting range. Does that hurt you yes. a little bit? Hmm? Does it hurt you a little bit? Like, are you going to, I'm guessing you'll be missing it by the end of that quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, practical shooting after dark. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Ben on deck today. No stranger to uh, this show is Mr. Joel Park. Hello everyone. Yes. Uh, from Nebraska, from Alberta, we have Mr. Jeff Chang. Hello everyone. Oh. Wow, it's going to be a bang up podcast. I was going to say quite a spicy podcast here. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> got my got my Tabasco sauce. Spicy! I got to go, man. Ready to yes. run some people through the mud? Let's go! No, yeah, I'm just like, gonna, I'm not going to do good. that. I know. Um, all right, Mr. Joel, I don't know what you're going to talk about. I don't know what your topic is, but I so I'm curious now. Well, so. Crazy talk as usual. Well, it's show and tell, but there's really not a purpose in showing it. But uh, I started practicing with steel more this year. What? Well, back up a little bit. I recently discovered. Tell me more, Joel. <laughs> there's no, I realized there's nothing I could say or do to get access to the props at my club. So it was time to start buying some. So is that what happened? It is what happened. Or did somebody strongly encourage slash bully you into well, that, buying some steel? <laughs> well, I thought getting. Getting access would be a pretty good uh, chance since I set up a, a stage at the club like every single month and uh, no sense of getting into it. But I found out that wasn't going to happen. So like, OK, I'm going to buy some because, you know, I'm cheap. So if I could get it for free, why would I buy it? But anyway, uh, so in the past, I've been practicing with poppers quite a bit and I have some things to say about the plates. So first off, I think they're more beneficial to practice with than poppers, even if you're using minis um, because of the precision required. So with poppers, you might luck out and get a hit above or below the calibration circle and, you know, like it still goes down. It also makes the transition less critical considering, you know, there's usually an elevation change needed with the target transition. So uh, one thing I started doing was putting, I have two of them, just two eight inch round plates. Um, I started putting both of them fairly close to each other, no matter the distance or difficulty but not just having kind of one plate out in the middle of the open, because I feel like having one plate in the middle really encouraged firing hopers, like I would say in quotes, where you kind of just swing the gun there. And I mean, yeah, maybe you normally hook up, but um, I could appear to be successful while creating bad habits. So I started liking two, where I have to move the gun precisely, and maybe I shoot a pair on that, or I shoot that plate and then I transition precisely to another plate and have a lot of control. So. Um, I also like shooting a pair of shots just on an array. So I see the plate, and it's like two on that plate, and then I move off to paper. So, um, so I really wouldn't get a lot, getting a lot out of using them. I think people should be practicing on steel if they aren't already. I use steel, so I have the same setup that you have, Joel. Coincidentally, yeah. I'm sure. Yes, uh, of course. A lot of, uh, I like eight-inch plates. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. One of the reasons I like them a lot is they are uh, lighter and easier to deal with than, uh, than poppers. Yeah. Especially if you're driving your stuff out to the range to sh and then, you know, setting it up and then taking it down. The eight inch plates are the bomb. They're not heavy. They're not, they're, you know, they're super easy to deal with. And they're, I think, a more appropriate target for the reasons that you described. So I like that. They're, they're, I use them all the time, Joel. I, I yeah. like them a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. And these are the MGM I got, which was just, I mean, whatever. I think AM are fine, but it's just three pieces. So you have the base, you have just a two by four, uh, three metal pieces rather. So you have the base, just any two by four, whatever length you want. And then it's kind of got a cap that goes on and then it's got kind of a, like a hook, I guess you could describe it. The plate just slides on. So what it's did super you, easy to- What did you pay for these things? I think they were 120 bucks. And then- uh, yeah, my I mean, friend, that's, that's not my, that bad. My friend Cody got a pair also. So we got four of them and then MGM shipped them for free, which I don't know what the minimum to get free shipping is, but, or if that was a promo, I, I don't know, I think it was just regular. So anyway- uh, yeah, they shipped it for free, 120 bucks. They'll pretty much last forever. Um, so I think it was smart. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, ben beat me up a little bit because we went to go train. Well, like, no, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a dick. Like, we were just out there shooting. Yeah. I start a lot of my 
my explanations for me being a dick were like, I wasn't trying to be a dick, but um, <laughs> no, I, we were just, Joel just had paper targets that were shooting it. And I was like, wait, do you have any steel? And he's like, blah, 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 prop shed, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wait, so there's no steel? Like, I don't care about this prop. I don't care about that. Do we, do we have steel to shoot at or not? And then I became immediately confused as to how Joel's been practicing for how how, how long with no steel, like a year? Yeah, yeah. So has been no, no practice rounds fired at a piece of steel for a year. Well, I have friends that are part of the good old boy club. So I had access to them at times when I went to the range. It just depended on who I was practicing with. Oh, Jesus, Joel. And I, would, and I would just simulate those partials by, you know, like I could have a, a head box at 15 yards. Like, it's the same thing, right? It's like, eh, not no, really. it's not. It's not. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Uh, well, I've changed my should, way of thinking on that. You should thought, practice on steel and you should practice occasionally on falling steel. To where you're, you know, seeing it fall down and like you get punished for edge hits and that kind of stuff. Like, But the uh, static plates are my. They're my go-to for steel targets. I like, like them a lot. The steel challenge, I guess, style would be the easiest way to describe them for people that wouldn't be familiar. Yeah. But for sure, working on not just firing the hopers, that was something that I, I mean, I had, I mean, some Instagram runs, they looked hot at the beginning, but it's like, you know, how, what's the room for error on that? Am I really moving, transitioning the gun with precision or am I just kind of indexing and using the outline of the gun and maybe getting lucky? So... I didn't want to just be shooting like towards the steel or at the steel. I wanted to actually be aiming. So. Yeah. Well, fantastic. So uh, Gaston came up here and trained with me for a week. Maybe longtime listeners might have seen Gaston on here. So we trained up for, well, not for a week. I think we shot for four days. Joel was here as well. And then Gaston and I headed down to Florida and shot a match together. And that was super. So that is what I did. This week in shooting, Joel. Tell me more. Damn it. Uh, but I mean, uh, which part would you like to hear about? Uh, I don't know. Matches, Training? who cares? Like, you go to another match, you go to a place to shoot the things. Training is more, uh, like, <laughs> get into a tangent. Training is a lot more fun to me than shooting any match anyway. Like, us yeah. training, us training, being out there for, I think, four days, that was more fun than four days of matches to me. Yeah, I have a lot of fun training. So um, what I like to do, I try to put myself in a position where I can train with uh, shooters that are either really good or really smart. They don't need to be both. Gaston happens to be both. But um, like I would train with Jeff on the basis of him being smart because Jeff can make important observations. Be like, oh, Jeff's a smart guy. Like he could figure this out. You know what I mean? So G Gaston uh, ticks both of those boxes. He's a good guy to train with. He was flying up here to shoot a match in Florida. So uh, he was like, hey, I'll come train with you. And I was like, great. That sounds good. Then uh, Joel invited himself along, mm -hmm. which was also good. That didn't really happen, by the way. Joel's super polite. I invited Joel. I would but, not invite uh, myself, no. No, you would not. So, uh, well, what you experienced, Joel, with us was, uh, I'd, I'd say – a fairly typical training week when I have somebody here where it's go out to the range every day, uh, set up stuff, work on stuff, different people drive different things. So it's like, Hey, you build a stage or Hey, you, you pick the drill or Hey, you do this or so like different people are always kind of contributing some ideas. And then it's very helpful for everybody to, for, for two reasons. Number one, feedback, obviously you have other people to bounce ideas off of. And if they tick one of the two boxes by being either good at shooting or smart, then it's probably worth your time to bounce ideas off of them. And uh, the other thing is the accountability, which people wouldn't necessarily realize how important the accountability is, you know, but uh, having other people seeing what you're doing to where you can't be like, oh, yeah, that that shot was good or, you know, my dog ate my homework or whatever happened. Mulligans, I missed my draw, I'm going to start over again. Yeah. And it's not anything that anybody needs to say. It's just the way it is. It's there, there becomes accountability. Well, Jeff came down and trained me for a week or mm -hmm. however long. Yeah, which was, that was pretty much your experience, Jeff, training up for a while. It's like, yeah, this is, this is good. This is interesting. Uh, 
learn a lot. Uh, learning, I learn a lot in a hurry. So I've uh, I've extracted uh, pretty much all the knowledge that Gaston has at this point, which is good for me. I'm like a shooting knowledge vampire. So I've done my best to, to suck out his knowledge out of him. We, we recorded some training group content, which people will see in the group, of course, eventually. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's quite excellent. I enjoy training with people very much. Um, was that, did that pretty much match your experience, Mr. Joel? Yeah. You sure. The other thing I like is that sometimes somebody else will think of something that you think is stupid and whether you like it or not, you do it. So I'm thinking of like what we had at the back where you guys decided you wanted to practice shooting low. So we were shooting under that bench or that stand we were setting our range bags on. I'm like, I would have not done that if I was on my own. Like you're going to lean down way low, like shooting under this bench to shoot these steel. But then it's like, oh, maybe I'll have to do that at a match someday. So whatever you guys think of, I'll do it, you know, or it's like, hey, you're going to run around here and run some some stupid order around this barrels or something but then it's like oh yeah maybe i'll need to do it direction change like that in a match so it wasn't just stuff i could think of it's like hey what what would you guys do and that's probably different than what i would normally do right so try, and, 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 and setting up shots that um bordered on impossible and by impossible i mean uh not impossible strictly speaking but for the best guys around making that shot consistently under pressure in the middle of a stage or something like that it borders on being not doable to do it every time if you you get what i'm saying joel mm -hmm. so we set up a lot of borderline shots like that so we're running around then posting up and shooting really tight parcels or long parcels or or whatever else and then when you see other guys doing it consistently you quite naturally are like, no, this is doable. The people mm -hmm. around me are doing this. I need to be able to do this too. So it doesn't really matter how I feel about it. So that was good. I would say the training was about as difficult. If you're curious, Joel, the training that we did was pretty normal for difficulty. So a lot of, a lot of long shooting, 25, 30 yards, a lot of partial mm -hmm. targets, awkward positions, shooting and moving, really pushing each other. And then when, when Gaston and I got down to the match, uh, the match was not anything out of sorts. So the match yeah. we went to was the U.S. IPSC Nationals, and you watched that. I assume you watched the talk through that I've already posted up in training group, Joel. I watched most of it. Yes. Yeah. Well, did uh, I would say our training was harder than the match was. Yes. Yeah. So. Which is good. That's what you yeah. want, of course. Yeah. So we show up there. We're confident. We're feeling good. Gaston did did pretty well. I did pretty well. Like I, I mean, you know that. That's the way to go. So I, I, I enjoy those kind of those training concentration weeks with uh, with good guys like that. Had a great time. I did too. Would recommend. Would do again. Yes. Yeah. So as you guys are prepping for a big match like that, are you looking for particular elements of, of stages and practices? Yeah, and so like that? Um, for before we're going to a big match, we're going to look at the elements. So we looked at, hey – well, for one, we've been down to Universal. Gaston and I both have been there many times, uh, more times than I can count, I would say. Uh, and it's the IPSC Nationals, so I have a pretty good idea of what their idea of IPSC is. You know what I mean, Jeff? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, so I was like, hey, there's going to be one-handed shooting. There's going to be a very low position, probably prone uh, there's going to be a lot of leaning. There's going to be a lot of partial targets. There's going to be a lot of swingers. There's going to be a lot of, um, yeah, there's, there's just, there's going to be all these elements there that are, that are difficult. There might be shots that are stupid in terms, in terms of if, if I set up a shot and I say, Hey, this one's borderline impossible. We'll set, they'll set up some that maybe are impossible. And again, I don't mean impossible, strictly speaking. I mean, if I take the super squad and line them up, there is no chance, zero, that everyone is going to get through that, you know, that target without a penalty. There's like zero probability. Like people, like probably half of them are going to be, be get, getting penalties. So that was what we prepared for. And that was pretty much what we got. Pretty much. They didn't have any stuff that was so long or so far that people couldn't do it. There was one swinger that was tough, but that was... That was pretty much the only difficulty. So, yes, we look for those elements. Uh, and without looking, we started training those elements. Then Gaston took a look at the stages. He's like, shit, there's a 20-round weak hand stage. So we're going to do some weak hand shooting. 
Um, and that, that was pretty much the only thing that he saw in the stage diagrams that he'd want to train on. Everything else was, you can't really tell distances or anything, but we, we knew what we were getting into before we went down there and our, our expectations were pretty much met. The good thing for us is Gaston and I are both pretty strong on swinging targets on movers. So we didn't need to drag. I have a, a swingers of course that I can drag out and shoot at, but they, they take a long time. As you know, you got to reset them every run and all that shit. So I would prefer not to train on those in a, in a group. So we didn't have to do that. So that was, that was excellent. So we did, so we did not do swingers. That was the only thing we didn't do. Mm. All right. Yeah. So uh, the, the goal for us is just to be comfortable and confident when we walk around, uh, like walk on the stages and like, yep, I can do this. This, everything here is, is hittable for, for me. And so. then, you think it would be fair to say so the difficulty was very high the first couple of days and the last day it was still reasonable but it wasn't insane again it kind of it was like it was a little bit easier where you kind of build up at least for me anyway a comfort where it's like yeah this is a this is a this is a partial but it's not crazy and i could shoot everything you know four runs without having a yeah, penalty yeah so that's it that's intentional so we have the difficulty set very high uh to where the you know good guys are missing shots or hitting no shoots or trying to take stuff on the move that they can't they just can't really do it right then that sort of stuff and then the last you know towards the end you back it down just to the point where you don't walk off the range having used up 30 or 40 white pasters in a day and then go fly to a match because that's not good for some people i'm okay with that personally but gaston doesn't like that for, and I totally understand why he doesn't. He doesn't want to have his confidence shattered before he goes and shoots a match. I'm the same way. Yeah. Whereas I get my feelings hurt all the time, so it doesn't really bother me that much to hurt more. <laughs> so anyway, that is that is what we did. Super duper. So anything else, Jeff? You seem like you might have some questions. Anything? No. 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 Great. Training concentration with Gaston. And, and then, of course, we planned. I have to fly to Buenos Aires, I think, in January to train with him again. So that should be super. All right. Jeff, what are you going to talk about, my man? Uh, I guess I have a show and tell. Not strictly a shooting product, but I think it could be very useful. Uh, I am holding in my hand a little GPS tile. So it's the size of what, a large postage stamp, I suppose. And I tested this thing out on a trip I just did where I kind of went around the world. But this sits in your suitcase. There is a SIM card in there, and a, there's a data plan attached. And basically, every time it detects movement, it pings the beacon, and it records down its location on a app on your phone. Um, so we recently had some... A Canadian competitor went down to U.S. Ipsic Nationals, and Air Canada lost his bag on the way back. Oh, I think I heard about this. Right. Was um, the bag delayed or lost? They had lost it until a police report was either threatened or actually filed, in which case they then found it fairly quickly afterwards. What a coincidence. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, lovely. Uh, I'm sure these things happen a lot. I've heard of other competitors having their guns end up in a completely different country. And I feel like a device like, th like this that cost me, I think, 70 bucks or so is fairly cheap insurance for at least knowing where your bag is. Um, it, How accurate does it record the location? That's even my question. It's accurate enough that as I was moving with my bag um, across a city it would track where the bag actually was like to, actually, but they like, could you go and retrieve the bag if you, you could go retrieve the bag like yeah. you could figure out which car it's in if it's in a car close enough i'd say or like you wouldn't know if it's wow. coming out on the baggage claim like oh it's on this carousel kind of a deal or no it would show a location on on google maps so it may not have an exact carousel okay okay like, it would show your location in relation to it um, and then when you get close enough, it picks up on Bluetooth and it connects to your phone that way as well. So, Interesting. Yeah. Um, I think the data plan for this guy is like six bucks a month. You can stop and start whenever you want. And yeah, 
when it was sitting in my suitcase in my hotel room, it would tell me quite accurately where the hotel was and which part of the building it was in. So it's actually surprisingly accurate. Sounds cool, man. That's actually pretty interesting. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, that's uh, I've had my bags diverted or delayed a few times, uh, but never, never the airline saying we don't know where it is. Sorry. Haven't had that. I've heard of a few of those stories, unfortunately. <laughs> I could see that. Yeah. Yeah, it seems Air Canada sucks. Apparently. I, mean, just, I, saw, I saw some more stories online that involved Air Canada. <laughs> have you had, you've had good luck with Air Canada, Jeff? I actually have. Well, okay. I actually have. Maybe flying business class helps. I don't know. It's the only way to go. <laughs> Joel is shaking his head. What? <laughs> What's your problem, Joel? You guys just flexing on poor people. <laughs> All right, let's do some questions. We're gonna move. We're gonna move things along after the GPS tile. All right. <laughs> after taking one of your classes, I have incorporated more live fire into training. The muscles in my hands get extremely sore as I am making a serious effort to crush the gun consistently. Something that I tended to cheat. Excuse me. And dry fire. Wanzik is into sports medicine. So do you or he have any recovery tips? Right now, I end up waiting four or five days for my hands to recover. What? After live fire training. Yeah. That's what the man says. I would be worried <laughs> there's like a physical issue where you need to talk to a doctor about like, I don't know, bones, muscles, tendons. I mean, it really depends. I can see having your hands feel pretty damn raw after, but that's more of a dermatological kind of issue where you're gripping a gun, it, if especially, especially if it's a rough grip, then I can see your hands hurting. But if it comes down to muscles hurting and an inability to actually use your hands properly, yeah, maybe there's actually a medical issue there. Yeah, so aside from there being a medical problem, he might be... He might be crushing with his hands. I mean, literally all the time that the gun's in his hands. You know how most people kind of loosen their hands up a little bit when they reload or when they run mm -hmm. a little bit, something like he might, he might not be doing that. Uh, he might have his, uh, I don't know, be, he'd be doing that thing where they, they, you know, some guys torque their, their support hand forward to try to I'm gonna lock my wrists and they do that. And it's heinously uncomfortable for most people. He might be forcing himself to do something like that. I wouldn't have told him to do that in a class. I'm just saying, maybe, maybe he got an idea to do that. I don't, I, it should play like four or five days recovery after live fire is a lot. So I'd be curious what caliber he's shooting and how much, I mean, if he's going out and shooting 1500 rounds in a day and he doesn't dry fire, that would be maybe an issue. Uh, also, if he, he might have to work up to these sorts of things, you know, like, Dry fire 10, 15 minutes a day, grip at the gun properly. If you're cheating in dry fire, which you said he was, you dry fire 10 or 15 minutes a day, you know, live fire, not crazy, just live fire a little bit on, you know, one day, then maybe don't touch your gun for a couple of days and dry fire some more or whatever. And over the course of a, a few months, maybe he can work up to being able to go and shoot a lot in, in a day and not have his hands be destroyed after. Now, you're, if you're holding your gun properly, you will feel it the next day, probably. You're going to feel it, but you, you shouldn't be ruined. Yeah, I'd be interested what kind of pain he's having. If it's like, like I said, bone, muscle, like tendons, I would be talking to a doctor. If your hands are just getting chewed up from the grips being too sharp or the metal grip guns, uh, I like athletic tape to help that for sure. So, you know, maybe it'll help with your hands not being and, so And tender. you can put it on before you start shooting. If I'm going to shoot a whole lot, I might do that. Yeah, or even dry fire. There's a couple spots I'll put athletic tape in my hands that I know are going to get chewed up from dry firing. So that's fine. I guess it just depends on how bad the pain is or what type of pain it is. Absolutely. But yeah, five days is like something's got to change. That doesn't sound healthy. Something something is wrong. Though, you yes. Uh, I mean, the only time you see that is guys in classes who don't dry fire or shoot, turn up to a class and go hard for two days. And then after two days, their hands are fucked. I mean, that is a thing that happens. But that's yeah. people go from not practicing to getting chewed up. 
All right, next we'll do one more question because you know you guys are pretty tame today, so we gotta get you wound up. Hey Ben, being the fucking champ and all, are you still paying attention to what other shooters in your squad are doing, as in possible gaming options, or are you in your own world when shooting a match? I saw one of your latest video breakdowns. Um, I think you're talking about training group where you skip the drop turner, so you didn't have to do a reload. You see, did you see squad members copying you? Um, and uh, last question, are you the kind of guy that discusses sta stage options with some of your squad members before you're up? Well, Joel, you just squatted with me. What would you say? Well, I don't want to speak for Ben, but from what I've seen, yeah, like I would do the same thing Ben does, where I will talk about stage plans with anyone that wants to. Because guess what? Like, yeah, uh, maybe I'm, I'm GM, that's okay. But maybe there's a B-class guy that saw somebody that I didn't see. He saw some way to exploit the stage. He has a different idea about an activation sequence. Like there's yeah. a lot of people that contribute. Maybe he can't pull it off. Or maybe it's a B-class guy I train with. He's like, hey, I've seen you shoot. This is not a good idea for you. You should shoot it this way. Or, yeah, so I always talk about this stuff as a group. And that's the fun part of USBSA. I was looking at a stage. Like, what do you think the fastest way to shoot this is? And then based on your strength or weaknesses, you pick a plan. But just staying yeah. in your own little world. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But staying in your own no, little no. world. And not like talking to anyone, be, like sitting there with your hands in your pockets. I've got some great plan that you guys don't know about. That's just, I don't know, kind of dumb. Yeah. So for me, it doesn't like somebody can tell me a plan that they're going to do that I think is the dumbest thing in the world. And having that plan in my brain doesn't cause problems for me. So there's really no incentive for me to not talk it through with people or bounce it off people. There's a, a few stages, you know, here and there that you may not really be sure how to do and you actually get a real advantage talking to other people. What was that one? There was one we shot at Great Plains to over that bridge mm -hmm. where our squad really did not know the way to do it because it was such a, it was such a goofy circumstance where there's a, yep. a shaky bridge and you could do a bunch of crazy leaning and stuff or to save a, a, a lot of running mm -hmm. or you could do more running. And uh, it was not apparent even, even for very experienced people, it was not apparent the best way to do it looking at it and so even, that required a bit of teamwork to use that stage specifically i'm thinking about like i squatted with two guys that i am trying to beat at that match and after i got done like with john and matt i'd be like hey this is what i saw this is what i felt like if i had to do it again either i would or wouldn't i mean that's like i mean yeah, if they're, you gonna, they're gonna out you stayed me, on the bridge me. right i did yeah yeah and matt before me matt got off the bridge i'm like like asking Matt and he's like, he's very willing. He's like, I don't, if you're to do it again, yeah, he'd do that way. And I'm thinking, do I want to change my plan or not? But he was more than willing to answer any question I had about yeah, how he course. shot it. And, and he didn't fuck with you either. He wasn't no. like trying to like give you misinformation or anything like that. So yes, I, I like bouncing stuff off of people and I don't particular, I mean, people that don't want to, or that are withholding or that are weird and you don't see too many of them, even on the, even on a super squad situation, People are going to be pretty open about what they're doing because, you know, people are going to see what you do anyway. There's kind of no reason to hide, hide anything you're doing. So. I can think of activation sequences specifically where you, I mean, you don't think watching somebody standing back doesn't see the same way you see behind a gun. Where if I shot stuff, it's like, hey, there's all the time in the world. That is the plan. You should do it that way. Or, or you shoot it or you shoot a sequence and barely hang them in there. And yeah. Then, some of the guys watch that and they're like, oh, and you're just like, yep, I would not do that again. I got very lucky. <laughs> yeah. Would not yeah, we're totally, totally open about it. Like if I beat somebody, <laughs> I want to beat them because I outshot them, not because I out schemed or manipulated or gave them false information or. Well, I'll take it any way I can get it, but it's just. No, no you will it's not. Sir. More, it's just more fun just to be like open about what, what's going on. Yeah. And that's fun anyway. Yeah. Discussing stages. That's the fun part. So That's how do you guys how do you guys handle when someone comes up to you and tells you their really stupid stage plan? No, I won't. Tr I, I might try to talk them out of it, but usually no. It depends how well I know them. It has to be pretty dumb before you're going to be like, yeah, don't don't do that. Because <laughs> people come up to me, tell me their plans, and especially if they're almost about to shoot. All right, I'm not gonna. There's no point changing their plan now. <laughs> right. Well, like even people. Use when, when they're when they're next up, they'll be like, "Hey, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think?" It's like, you know what? Like, just... 
to use that bridge example, Matt, originally, we both talked about staying on the bridge. He decided right before he was up to, to get off the bridge. And so he just got done shooting. And I was following Matt. And Ben was reciting, like, Ben, I'm like yelling at him. I said, should I do that or should I do my plan? Ben said, can you change your plan this, this soon? And I said, probably. I, I think I could. And he's, if you have a plan in your head, just do it. That was the right advice to give. But it's like, yeah. you know, you have a whole squad that they're pulling for you. They don't want, nobody wants to see your friends mess up. So, yeah. no. Like, no, I no, just, you've been hanging out with Joel. All right. Well, most of my friends, except for Ben, don't want to see me fail. No, Ben's a nice guy. He doesn't. Like, he likes to pretend to be a dickhead sometime, but he's not. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, was it, a, was it a bang up podcast for you, Joel? That is the line. Well, was it? I know. It was amazing. All right. All well, I, all I thought it could be and more. Thank you so much for coming on, Joel, Jeff. Uh, listeners, if you have a question you want the answer to, go to bensticker.com. Send me your questions. We'd love to talk about it. It's going to be fantastic. And yeah, that's it. Been out, fuckers. No, it's not.